So happy Friday, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Beginning with Bees, small scale backyard beekeeping for beginners. Today is Friday, June 28th. This is Frequently Asked Questions, episode number 23. If you've been watching all of these, thank you for coming back. And to those of you who posted your questions last week, uh, thank you for those because that's how we end up with material to talk about every Friday. So I hope everything's going great for you. It's summertime officially. It's 82 degrees outside, even though we have rain coming. It is bright and sunny and I can't wait to get back out there. Some of the videos that I'll be showing up in the corners here during my presentation were filmed last night in my observation beehive because people are asking how it's going and get some updates on that. Full of brood, everybody's building up. And the scenes that you see, of course, are on the outside frames of an eight frame observation hive. So there's even more going on in between the frames as with any other beehive, those that are in the center, that's where the most brood activity happens. So we're gonna jump right into things today and uh, we have a lot to talk about, but we'll zip right through it. So the first one is from Thomas Komet. I have heard that bees will eat eggs and brood in certain situations. Is that true? Well, do eggs get eaten by bees? Sometimes the queen, when she's laying eggs and the hive or colony is not prepared to support those eggs, very interesting topic given that uh, I'm showing larvae in the colony right now. Uh, when the bees decide that the queen is overproductive, uh, if they can't stop her from laying, uh, the queen will often lay in a partially developed cell, she'll lay outside the brood area, and sometimes you'll see worker bees, nurse bees, following right behind her, and they'll actually be chewing up the eggs and they're gone the next day. So they do actually chew them up. As far as whether they ingest that um, egg, I can't say for sure. Some people say that uh, they actually do eat the eggs. Uh, I know they chew them up, they destroy them, much as they destroy and chew up and get rid of a lot of things inside that hive. So as far as whether they're actually digesting eggs, I don't know, but they definitely chew them up and eliminate them. So that's how they, especially, and when resources get low as well, they will cull away, of course, uh, the eggs first. They haven't hatched yet. It takes three days for an uh, egg to hatch. And after they hatch, that's when they're being fed. So that's the big demand on the hive's resources when those nurse bees have to use bee bread, which is pollen mixed with bee enzymes and everything else, and it's fermented to some degree. Uh, that and honey stores, uh, they all get consumed and used to provide for developing brood. So they're very expensive as far as the resources go. So in a time of dearth, they may in fact kick up their removal of eggs and that's their way of shutting down the queen's production. So yeah, they do in certain situations. And as I said, it's usually when the colony has, uh, you know, low resources coming in and an expanding brood frame. So again, the queen is not in charge really. Those nurse bees are, and they're the ones that march around with the queen and decide uh, what she does and where. The next question is from Pepper Sanchez. Can you do a tutorial on how to become a registered beekeeper? All right, you know what? That is state by state. And rather than do a tutorial within my state, the state of Pennsylvania in the Northeastern United States, uh, you are required if you keep even one beehive, uh, you have to register with the Department of Agriculture. And what I'm going to do, if you're in the state of Pennsylvania, I'm gonna put a link down in the video description below and uh, it will show you there's a PDF and there's also, of course, a description about why you have to register and you do pay a fee and then you're registered by the apiary. Now, we talked about this. Um, you get a registration number, but if you're, you have one or two hives, the chances of you being visited by a state inspector are very slight. So you may have to call the inspector if you think something is going on. Although if you're a commercial beekeeper and large scale, then you're definitely going to be visited by the inspector. And when he's already in your area, that's a great time to get some face time with that inspector and learn about what's going on. When we've talked about this in the past, I've had some uh, commenters get very unhappy with the idea that I would even promote uh, complying with state ordinances and regulations that they don't feel that the state has any business in their backyard or in their bee apiary. Well, I'm, I'm gonna say this one last time. Uh, when it comes to me personally, if there are ordinances in place, 
then I'm going to, to the best of my ability, I'm going to comply with those. And that includes registering my apiary with the Department of Agriculture so that uh, I pay a small fee. And I personally look forward to visits from the state inspector. I absolutely enjoy the time talking with him. And I get to learn about what other beekeepers are facing, what issues they're having, and how they're resolving those issues. So it is a fantastic learning opportunity. I've never known of anyone who had an inspector show up and destroy their apiary. Uh, you know, many years ago, apparently there were problems with inspectors that came out and uh, or somebody came home and found their whole apiary burned because of uh, suspected American fowl brood, for example. Those days are gone. You get uh, a discussion and uh, you may find your colonies quarantined. They do let you know that they're coming. They don't just show up. But it's, you know, it's a regulation. I personally follow the regulations. I'm not telling you what you have to do. So you're wasting your breath if you post a big argument on this. By the way, if you want to know what other subjects we're going to cover in this Frequently Asked Questions video, please look in the video description. But for me, I support the Department of Agriculture and I definitely comply with their regulations. Next one is from Wendy, Wendy Bachman. Should I rough up the interior surface of my beehive so the bees will put propolis on it. So that's very interesting. Um, it, what is propolis first of all? So some people say propolis, propolis. If you go to Webster it says propolis. Um, so here's the thing. Apparently when you break that down it means pro propolis for the population or something like that. Anyway, um, there is antibacterial material in propolis, and there are coniferous trees. There are a bunch of different tree types that they're going to get resin from that they're going to use to seal things up inside the hive. And this is a very interesting question, and I'm really glad that Wendy asked it because it led me on a search before I prepared my answer today. And we find out that uh, there's actually research going on right now. In fact, I was just going through Tom Seeley's book here. The Love of Bees, The Untold Story of the Honeybee in the Wild, talks about propolis there too, and the propolis envelope, the sealing of the entire interior of a hive. Normally, of course, if they were feral, they would be in a tree. All the surface inside that tree, the hollow area, would be rough and porous. So what the bees do is they use resins from plants, and they seal up all the little porous areas and the cracks and crevices, and they block them. And sometimes they try to block venting in hives too with their propolis. Some people say, if I leave too much venting in winter, it won't matter because the bees will close it off with their propolis if they don't like it. Well, that's not true because in the winter time, they can't get out and fly and get more propolis and bring it in and it's not warm and gooey enough for them to work it up to seal those things. So the propolis work that the bees are doing is normally during they're harvesting foraging time of year. So it's when they can get out, when they can get that and come back. Sometimes people see honeybees on the landing board and they'll have a pearly, shiny, amber droplet on their hind leg where pollen should be. And they're like, oh, what's that? You know, it looks really shiny. I don't understand. It looks like a bead. That's propolis. So, and some bees bring in more of it than others. So during the warm times of the year, they're gonna work propolis all over the place. And some bees do it more than others. So since they're doing it on rough surfaces, now that leads me to research that's going on right now. So it's a timely question. Marla, Marla Spivak, she's uh, heading a program that's doing research on propolis traps. And so what they're doing is they're, they look like queen excluders that they're sticking on the interior boxes of the hives and it encourages the bees to fill those up and they trap the propolis on there and that creates this antibacterial environment. So what does that do for the bees? Well, here's another interesting thing about it. I mentioned earlier with the inspectors that sometimes if you had foul brood that uh, you would be quarantined and possibly even have to burn your stock and your, your hardware and your woodenware. So here's the thing. The antibodies on the bees, like a teeter-totter, when the antibodies on the bees goes up, that means the antibacterial capabilities of the hive itself has gone down. As propolis is built up and sealing the interior surfaces of your hive, then the antibodies that the bees are producing go down. So just like when your body's producing antibodies and you're fighting off some kind of infection, 
we know then that you've got the infection. So they can, you know, when your antibodies are up and white blood cells are up or whatever, you're fighting an infection, so now they look for the infection. With the bees, when their antibodies are up, it means that the hive that they're living in might not be the healthiest. So these antibiotic properties of propolis, and they have very specific trees. They even went down to that. I probably should put a link to that. But uh, like antimicrobial activity in the propolis from poplar trees, for example. I have a huge stand of poplar trees. Cottonwood, those are high on the list. Things like pine and fir trees, uh, those are very low, even though there's are high resin trees. If you ever scratch a pine tree, the sap comes out and it's really thick and gooey. Apparently the bees don't think a lot of that. It's highly aromatic, but apparently the antibiotic capabilities of the resin from coniferous trees is not as good as that that's coming from the cotton trees and the poplar trees. So very interesting stuff there. So they're actually, when they create this propolis envelope, which is about a millimeter thick, so they do cake it up in areas, but overall when they're completely sealing an area, uh, they create a naturally antibacterial environment for the bees, for the colony, and they are protected. Even American fowl brood and European fowl brood spores are impacted by and reduced by a propolis envelope. How about that? So then, of course, back to Wendy's question, should I intentionally rough up the inside of my hive boxes? I can't say that you, that you should do that. Although, if you do it and the bees seal it up with propolis, then uh, that's going to improve the antibiotic, according to what I've read and what I researched this week, that will improve the health and well-being of the colony inside a propolized hive body. So if they do a complete envelope of a, a thin layer of propolis, now does that mean you can get in there and paint propolis all over everything? I don't think so. Because when you heat it up to melt it so you can spread it with a brush or something like that, I think they also did studies on that. The propolis is best when it's applied by the bees themselves. Here's another thing that happens. The microbial activity within the propolis that's beneficial to the bees, when you go into a heavy winter, like we have here in the state of Pennsylvania, and that exterior surface of that box gets really cold, the antibacterial properties are defeated. So, but during winter, the disease, of course, is not transferring around colony to colony. But in the spring, again, what they do is they refresh that coating. So they refresh the surface and, uh, of course, restore renewed microbial and antibacterial properties to that interior propolis surface. The propolis envelope is restored and hive health is better off. This, this led me way down the rabbit hole on some other stuff too. Some people are using uh, essential oils a lot and uh, have found out that they're using essential oils because it knocks down bacteria. Uh, if your essential oil concentrations are high, you can actually damage beneficial bacteria. So you create kind of a sterile environment, uh, which isn't great. So in other words, let the bees do their own. So if you're into natural remedies, uh, back off on the essential oils if you're using it to kill bacteria in your colony. And instead, as, uh, as Wendy suggested here, find ways to encourage propolis coatings by the bees themselves. That's going to be number one. This is interesting. We're going to pay attention and learn more about that. After winter, they refresh it because it's damaged. Leave as much as possible in the hive because when it's hot and sticky, like today, it's 82 degrees. By the way, I have my little uh, hive visors on that are shading the landing boards and everything. Those are working fantastic. Uh, when it's nice and hot like this, they actually rework and move it around. That's interesting too. So that's a great question. And uh, if you want to do some experimenting and, and take your, especially the brood box, I would say, because that's where all your bees are going to be. If you can find a way to rough that up or put something on the surface, look into uh, propolis traps. See how they're made. See if you can replicate that. Some people we were talking with our uh, beekeeping organization yesterday. We had a breakfast. and I'm sorry, that was Wednesday. And um, some people talked about attaching screen material to the interior surface of the hive, and that caused the bees to propolize it. I don't think I'm going to go that far because I don't want, you know, 
all that additional material in my colony, but I am gonna pay attention. I have some rough cut lumber that I've used to make my feeder shims. I'm gonna pay attention to the interior. I did look at the underside of those because they're rough cut pine. I did not notice that the bees coated that overall, but they did seal corners and crevices and things like that. So the propolis, that's an interesting area and, and might be an answer to some holistic control of bad bacteria, bad uh, issues going on inside your colony. Great question. Number four, Eli Ark. Would it be practical or effective to have empty hives set up to encourage a closer relocation or will the bees travel wherever they please? I think he's talking about swarms. And uh, this happens to me anyway, but you know what? Unless you mark your queens, you don't know where your bees have come from. I've had unoccupied hives, which is, okay, let's just admit that that's a bad idea to leave unoccupied hives in your apiary just because small hive beetles might move in. You might get wax worms and things like that. Uh, but I'm guilty of doing it. Once I've, you know, once there's been a dead out sometimes, I'm slow at cleaning things up. I uh, let them clean out the frames. Another bad idea, because now we're spreading whatever's in there to all the other colonies. But what's happened is I've had volunteer swarms. They've just moved right in, and that's a hive sitting two feet off the ground in the apiary on a rack. Um, no dead bees in it because it's been swept out. But uh, you just go out there one day and you think it's just being robbed out, but it isn't. They're bringing in pollen and resources and they're cleaning it up. Uh, thieves don't clean. So if you see them dragging out little bits and pieces and cleaning the colony out, uh, you, gotta, you got a swarm that just moved in. So that can happen. So, um, you know, they travel wherever they please. Absolutely. Bees go wherever they please. It's the Honeybee Democracy by Tom Seeley. Those scouts go out, they look for a place to live, they find the best place. If that best place happens to be one of your hives in your backyard apiary, they're going to move into it. I've also learned that they go more for a tall uh, hive body. So if you've got a 10 frame, 8 frame 10 with a 8 and a medium. So we've got the deep and the medium on top of it. They move into that one quicker than they do just an 8 by itself. And they'll also move into a 10 but they prefer if there's height in there for some reason. So also if you look at those uh, swarm trooper, storm, swarm trooper, swarm traps, they are tall and skinny. So that's uh, appealing to the bees. They like tall stuff. I guess if you're looking at a dead tree or it's hollowed out, it's got some kind of knot hole in it and a dead core that the bees would be moving into, we know that that's gonna be tall and skinny. So interesting stuff. But yeah, they'll move in wherever they want, but you can get, uh, in fact, put uh, Swarm Commander or some of the lemongrass oil or something else inside that colony that's empty, the, the hive, and uh, keep it up in the far back and just touch a little bit on the landing board. Don't overdo it. If you overdo it, they don't show up at all. If you can smell it, the bees are smelling it. Their olfactory senses are much higher than ours. They're gonna find it and scouts are gonna explore that area. You're gonna see scouts coming and going. If they move in, you got them. So, but they definitely go wherever they want, but you're not wasting your time leaving a couple of empty hives in your apiary. Uh, you already have bees there. You got bee visitors. You got scouts cruising through. Number five, why is comb honey popular? Okay. What well, somebody call, some people call it chunk honey, honey in the comb. Why is that popular? First of all, I don't know that it's that popular. Uh, I don't sell a lot, so we don't sell chunk honey, but I do know the origin of it. And I know why people used to buy chunk honey. This is chunk honey right here. This is honey still in the comb. See that? So here's the thing, you know, a hundred years ago, this will shock you. There were people that were actually faking honey and selling fake honey. Do you believe it? Can't believe it. So anyway, uh, people were skeptical. I'm originally from Missouri, that's the show me state. You have to prove to me that what you're selling me is real. I don't, just don't take your word for it. But when they sold it in uh, the comb, like chunk honey, like this stuff right here, there was no question that the bees made that and that the honey in there was made by bees and put there by bees because it's capped. These are the cells, hexagonal cells made by bees cut out from the hive and that's how you know, that's real honey. 
So the other thing is, uh, bees work into their cells, a lot of antibacterial materials and stuff. So bees wax is good for you. You can chew it, you can eat it, you can swallow it, you can eat the honey, but there's no question that that is real honey made by bees. That doesn't mean that somebody didn't feed them a bunch of sugar water and stuff to build that up, but at least you know, in this, uh, in this state, in that form, chunk honey, that is uh, made by real bees. It's not fake. So that's the early thing. You know, they bought it in that form so they knew for sure that somebody was selling them something that wasn't just a thick sugar syrup. So uh, what's the benefit? Well, and also, by the way, talking about the propolis, some people chew propolis. Did you know that? So you could save chunks of propolis, and apparently you can also benefit from the antibacterial properties of it. So I don't chew a lot of propolis, but... Um, just more food for thought on things that you can eat that come out of your beehive. But that's where chunk honey comes from. Most expensive honey for the bees because they're giving up all their wax to produce it. Uh, which leads me to another discussion. When I introduced those Saskatrass bees this year and I put them in because I wanted to show you what you would be dealing with. So I put a bunch of empty frames and foundation in those hives. Huge mistake on my part. And the reason is when you're starting bees and you have a package of bees, uh, and if you've got a bunch of drawn out comb that you could have put in there, which is what I have and didn't use because I was going to show you what it's like. And by the way, all those colonies are doing great right now. They would have been triple in production what they are right now if I had just provided them with already drawn out comb. And uh, I did it just so people could see what it would look like from the beginning, but I won't be doing that again. I'll be talking about that in theory because I really set those bees back. If I put them in deep boxes with drawn out comb from my storage, uh, they would already be filling it with honey because they are booming right now and they don't have room to put their uh, eggs and larvae and they don't have capped brood to the extent that they should. And they, by the way, don't like those Man Lake plastic pre-waxed frames at all. They like the acorn frames, they go for those first. Pirco, I've, you know, as they're getting old, I'm cycling those out and I'm replacing them with acorns. So again, I'm not gonna play around with any of the other one piece deep frames that are made out of plastic. I'm only gonna use acorn because they're the ones that the bees are using the fastest. So if you've got frames of drawn comb and you're starting your bees, put that stuff in there. Don't hold back. So that's why it was popular. There was no doubt of where that came from. Number six, live, laugh, love. Do bees recognize different people? Would bees be less calm or more aggressive around a stranger versus you? I don't think that bees recognize individuals more so than other individuals. Like, I think that the way you conduct yourself in a bee Apiary, if you, the way you conduct yourself around bees, how calm you are, what you smell like, what you look like. If you're a high contrast person, um, you know, if you have a bunch of perfume or if you've got some kind of aftershave that they don't like. I've heard that if you're eating bananas, that that's bad because uh, the scent from, you know, banana oil for some reason makes them want to sting you. I've never tested it. But, uh, Different people, no, I think different people behave differently. So I think that they bring out the worst in bees sometimes. I do know that people with big heads of bushy hair can get bees stuck in their hair if they have fuzzy clothes on, dark clothes. Nitrile gloves, if you have blue gloves on, you don't get stung. Probably white gloves the same, but those that have taken those um, carpenter gloves that are like this, they're black, they get stung on the hand because these don't protect you from stings at all. All they do is serve as a visual deterrent so that it keeps your hands clean and uh, the bees aren't interested in your hands, but blue, they don't seem to pay attention to. Black gloves, they do, they're gonna sting you. So I think it's about the conduct of the people, how noisy they are, how much they move around, and whether or not they aggravate the bees. Keep in mind, your queen is laying over a thousand eggs a day. She, during you know the nectar flow and during the season that they're procreating, while the queen is doing that, then that means there are a thousand new bees coming out of that hive and doing orientation flights every single day. So you're encountering new bees all the time. 
So the very idea that bees would recognize you and know you, oh yeah, there's Fred, you know, he came back out here, we like him. Ooh, we don't like Annette, go sting her. My wife gets stung every time she goes in the apiary. But it's always because they get caught in her hair and then they just get frustrated and sting her. It's not because they see her, don't like her, single her out, and then go after her that way. So I don't think they recognize people. I think people that are comfortable around bees that aren't perspiring, that aren't nervous, that aren't jittery, that, that don't have fluid movements, that bang and bump and, you know, speak loud. You know, when you talk loud, your voice, noise is mechanical energy that the bees can pick up on as well. Maybe you breathe on them, maybe you have bad breath. You should drink coffee before you go out. That's what I do, and that keeps them happy around me. I don't have my bees coming after me. By the way, I don't mind not being stung. I don't get stung, so. I got one sting this week on the back of my leg, and that's because a bee had walked up the back of my pant leg, and I kneeled down to do something, and I squashed the bee behind my knee, and it stung me. So it didn't have a choice. It's not a hater. Okay, why are bee veils black? You know what? Here's another example of somebody posting a question that I think is fantastic because it led me down, you know, a path of discussion. And again, at the beekeeper breakfast, if you don't belong to a beekeeper organization, I highly recommend that you join one or at least start some kind of fellowship of beekeepers. I can never make it to my um, organization's weekend gatherings because I'm always busy. I'm always taking photos and always doing video work on weekends. Uh, so I can't make it to these big meetings, but we have these Wednesday breakfasts and it is super productive because you get to talk to everybody about what's going on. So here's a veil. And of course this veil is from Guardian Bee Apparel. Look them up because they make this really cool zippered veil so that you don't have to take your suit off to drink and stuff. For me, that's critical. You know, if I'm in my bee yard, I want to be sipping stuff and hanging out. And then when you go back to work, zip this up, close it off, and you're back in there. And these are vented bee suits on a day like today. Don't even go out there without a vented bee suit. You're going to be sweating like crazy. And I'll put a link to the Guardian Bee Apparel people. But the question comes in, why is this black? Well, my answer was, well, I think because screens are normally black and a lot of this stuff is derived from manufactured material that's already already in use for screens and things like that. But then of course, like anything else, I had to do some research and we had some discussions. So there were beekeepers in our organization that said that, you know, they get, bees are bouncing off their veil all the time. So I think, you know, I think we can go right back up here to live, laugh and love and say that those bees don't like those people because they're not bouncing off my veil. And I wear it like this is what they call the professional veil because it's really short. There's another one that stands out further. Uh, this is so I can get my camera up to my face and everything. But uh, so I thought, wow, why are they black then? If that's going to cause the bees to be annoying. The thing is, the black cuts down on glare. So you visually can see things better and you can see your bees better. And there are actually studies going on dealing with veil colors. So there's a bicolor veil in the works right now. The outside material would be white. And then that would cause, and by the way, members of my beekeepers organization are actually spray painting and painting their exteriors white now just to find out what's going on. So the exterior screen being white and the interior of the screen being black gives you the best of both worlds. Non-glare, you're looking at your bees, you can see the eggs and things like that. On the outside, it's white and non-threatening to the bees so they won't be, the guard bees won't be bouncing off of your veil. So I think that's interesting, but here's the bottom line. You're already wearing the veil. You're already protected. If you've got some guard bees that get mad at you and they start bouncing off the veil, they're not stinging it. They're just wasting their energy trying to fend you off. So if you want to keep your bees calm, paint your screen on your veil white. Really interesting area of discussion. Another question I had, and I forget sometimes, you know, we, we use terms in beekeeping that if you're a brand new beekeeper, they seem alien. And we always say when you're, when your bees draw out comb. So, I mean, it seems obvious to me that there's a, a foundation and the bees are manufacturing honeycomb and building out their cells until they're at full depth so they can either store honey, store pollen, 
or raise baby bees? Uh, so the question was, what is drawn out? And uh, well, that's just it. So when you look at the foundation of, you know, a frame of bees there, if you put it in and there is no foundation and they're just starting out, they start to build their wax and drawing it out just means they deepen the cells until they get to a full depth cell for whatever purpose they're going to use it for. If they're making a queen cell, they're going to draw out a queen cell, which means they take a normal cell. If it's in the field or on the edge, and they're going to keep building out the wax until they have a full size cell for the queen. In fact, sometimes when they just start the hexagonal field of the cell, the bottom of it, a queen will come along and lay an egg in there. We know that cell is not deep enough to develop a full scale healthy bee. But what happens is as that egg hatches in three days and then as the larvae starts to be fed, there are other workers that are still manufacturing that cell and drawing it out. So by the time it reaches the age of capping and then it becomes pupa, uh, the cell is finished. So that's an interesting thing. You know, I wouldn't know half of the stuff if I didn't have an observation hive to look in and see this, these works in progress and how the bees are handling different things. But drawing out a cell is just a manufacturer of a cell with bees wax and the bees make that themselves. They get little shingles of wax on their uh, abdomens and they rake them off and work them up and stick them on and then you'll see the bees on the edges of it and their heads are wobbling like this. They're working up the wax and they're mixing it and uh, they're engineers. So that's it. That's what that is. Drawn out. And do bees reuse wax? Here's the thing. I always thought that the bees pulled off caps and discarded them because you would see them dropping all over the bottom of uh, the solid bottom boards of beehives. And then once in a while, you'll see the workers fly them out. Now, does that mean 100% of the wax that they're cutting away gets removed? Apparently not. Because recently I was looking at the queen cells in my observation hive. So once again, thanks to the observation hive, we get to see what goes on. And they had uncapped, the queen had hatched, and she's carving out. You know, the queen bee in her peanut shell is cutting away at her opening, but the bees on the outside were helping. And when that wax cap from that queen cell was finally getting free, and by the way, you walk away, get a cup of coffee, come back, and it's gone. So, you know, I've seen this for years, and I never saw the moment that the cap comes off because I wanted to see the worker take that cap and run away with it. And because of the observation hive, she should have taken it to the bottom, over to the exit and out the tube and flown away with it. Or one of the foragers would take it out. But instead, the cap peels off and the worker just reattached it and stuck it right on the side of that peanut shell looking queen cell. Now they're going to dismantle the queen cell anyway. So that's reuse of wax. If they're sticking it and making it a part of a big glob of wax anywhere inside the hive, they're reusing it. So cap wax, when they're pulling it off, like in the flow hives, they cut away the cap wax as soon as those cells are empty. And next thing you know, they're uh, out the door with it. But uh, in other cases, they're actually going to use it and contribute. So somebody's at the door. Okay, well, that was FedEx dropping off a brand new Flow Hive 2 seven frame, 10 frame Langstroth matchup. And I'm gonna be doing pyrography on it for an upcoming beehive decorating contest. So it's a happy Friday for me. So that's pretty much it. What else did I wanna talk about? In closing, if you've got questions, please write them down in the comment section below. If you don't subscribe to me yet, please feel free to subscribe and then hit the little bell and make sure that you get notifications. What's coming up this week? I'm planting these milkweed seeds, swamp milkweed seeds. So starting them inside. So I'll be reviewing that and showing you what to do, but we're getting into milkweed season. They're just starting to bloom. Milkweeds are loaded with nectar. So that's the other thing. Another thing I wanted to mention, get the pesky bees that you're trying to get off of the edges of your hive before you close it up. Get these little air cans, just 
lightly puff them, they blow right off. There's always one or two bees that are just tenacious and they're just hanging out. Just get in there and poof it off. You can blow at them, but it makes them mad. You poof them off with one of these air cans. Don't squeeze it all the way or it actually gets really cold and sprays some liquid material out. Just little light puffs, like leave this fly right here on my honey. Got him. Got him again. Get lost. Anyway, I went outside for the FedEx and brought in a fly. That's super annoying. The other thing is summer reading list. There are some books that just came out that are fantastic. Now, maybe you already knew about this book. This is Queen Spotting, Meet the Remarkable Queen Bee, and it's by Hillary, Kern Hillary Kearney of Girl Next Door Honey. She lives in San Diego. She teaches about bees and created this great book, which by the way, I'm not very far into it, but it has all these foldouts. If you want to test your ability to spot the queen bee, and if you want to get some tips and tricks on how to spot the queen when you're checking out your colony, this includes 48 queen spotting challenges. So summer reading, you want to involve your kids, test how sharp their eyes are. I have nothing to do with her. I have nothing to do with her book other than recommending it to you. And I'm going to put a link. It's on Amazon now. Obviously, I just got mine. I paid full price for all this stuff. The next one, uh, Following the Wild Bees, The Craft and Science of Bee Hunting. Now here's the thing, this is by Tom Seeley. Tom Seeley is by far my favorite writer of books about bees, all the way back to the honeybee democracy and so on. Now here's a ripoff. This shows people walking around. I get these questions on YouTube too. How do I follow wild bees? First of all, the wild honeybees are actually feral honeybees. Let me warn you about what a time waster this can be because you end up making a little trap for the bee and it's got sugar water in it and the bee gets in there and starts eating the sugar water and then you close it and it's opaque. Then you open the back of it and there's a clear lucite panel in there. So the bee goes into that. Then you close off the intermediate. Now you have your bee locked in that lucite panel, right? Then you open the front again and you let another bee come in and you get a bunch of them like that all at one spot and you feed them and then you open that middle part and you open the glass part and they go to the light and then you close them up and they're in there. Now, once you have them all and they're fed and they're fat, you can move those bees because they've been fed to a new location. So you saw the direction they came from. So now you're gonna move in that location, right? And then you're gonna release them and then you're gonna time them and you're gonna see, wow, he's back in four minutes, back in three minutes. So this bee flew to wherever it lives, unloaded its nectar, came back, here's the ripoff. You're supposed to be finding feral colonies. So you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna find one in a bee tree. I'm gonna find one, you know, where I can collect it. No, you just hiked all the way to your neighbor's apiary. So, I'm just warning you. Following the Wild Bees is a great book, but the cautionary tale, if you build the kit and you start following the bees, to collect those wild bees, if you live where there's a bunch of other beekeepers, you're just going to be following your beekeeper friend's bees. So, word of the wise. Next one. This one just came out. Nice book. Summer read. The Lives of Bees. The Untold Story of the Honeybee in the Wild. And this was interesting too because we just talked about the propolis envelope. He talks about that in here too. Tom Seeley is at the... Uh, Cornell Department of Entomology here in the United States, widely respected bee expert. This is fantastic history on what bees do, why they do it. And uh, so another good read, The Lives of Bees. So I'll put links to all these books down below. And uh, if you like to read over the summer and you want to be smart about bees, you want to involve your kids, again, Hillary Kearney, she just did a live, that's how I found out about this book. Uh, Flow Hive did a Facebook Live thing, and I guess they flew Hillary Kearney from San Diego, California, all the way out to um, New South Wales, Australia. Anyway, she was actually there with Cedar Anderson going through beehives, and she was showing in live real time on Facebook uh, how she spots queens and stuff, and that's how I found out about this book, and then I went to Amazon, I bought it, I got it, and I am enjoying it, so I'm passing the information on to you. If you have questions, write them down below. We'll do another one next Friday. And intermediate to that, of course, I'm going to be showing how I start these uh, milkweed seeds. And there's going to be lots of video coming up just showing step-by-step -step how to do that. And also, you know, the starting system that I have.
Thanks for watching. I hope you have a fantastic weekend and let me know what your questions are and feel free to answer other people's questions as always down in the comments section. If you want to share a link to one of your videos and show people what you're doing and how you're doing it, you are more than welcome to do that. Don't be frustrated when it disappears all of a sudden because when there are links like that, I have to release them one by one, but it will be released so people can go and see what you're doing. Thanks as always. Take care of your bees. Have a great weekend.